Well, there are two stories about the Ukraine. The American story is that the United States supported uh, people who demanded respect for their human rights. And they gave money to it and so on. The Russian story is that a democratically elected government, was democratic, was overthrown by a mob. The Constitution changed on a Sunday morning, and the entire attempt underwritten by the United States. The view of the Americans is we gave the Ukrainian people the right to choose. The view of the Russians is they chose. You didn't like the choice. You did this. Leaving apart the rhetoric, and I was in Russia and had an opportunity to talk to people, and it was interesting. Uh, leaving apart the rhetoric, here's the fact. If you draw a line from St. Petersburg to Rostov, you draw the line that's the base of the European peninsula. To the west of this line are the Baltics, Belarus, Ukraine, part of the European peninsula. To the east of this line is Russia. Russia must move to the west if it is to have any access to the sea and if it's to have any buffers. And fair or not, it regards this first line of countries as essential to its survival. It can live with a neutral Ukraine. It cannot live with a pro-Western Ukraine. The United States has its own primordial fear. The one thing that frightens the United States is a hegemon that can marshal all the resources of Europe. For a century, the First World War, the Second World War, the Cold War, US foreign policy pivoted around preventing that happening. If the Russians have Ukraine and the Europeans are as weak and as fragmented as they are, where do the Russians stop? So you have two nations with reasonable fears of each other, and that's where conflict comes from. General Hodges, who commands US forces in Europe, US Army forces in Europe, visited Kiev last week, announced that US trainers were going to be arriving, and also pinned medals on, a Ukrainian, on Ukrainian soldiers for heroism. The symbolism of that was enormous. He also announced that the United States would now be pre-positioning armor, artillery, and other equipment in the Baltics, in Poland, and Romania. That is the cordon sanitaire of this containment. The United States is signaling the Russians that even if you regain, regain Ukraine, we will stop you. And this is done outside of NATO without any expectation of help from the Europeans. Once again, the Europeans become irrelevant to this. The Russians now have a very important choice. They were badly beaten in Ukraine. They first had a pro-Russian government. They held on to Crimea. They never invaded Crimea. They were there by treaty. And they failed miserably in an uprising in the East. The Ukrainian section of the FSB was fired, and Putin announced two weeks ago a complete restructuring of the FSB. In terms of the FSB is the foundation of the Russian state, and it was shown to be incompetent. This is a huge crisis in, in, in Russia. So, without going into all the details, the question that has always been at stake is, where is the western border of the Russian Empire? The Americans want there to be no buffer between the peninsula and Russia. And they justify this by the right to national self-determination. The Russians insist that there at least be neutrality. And they justify this by the right to national self-determination for the Russians in the east. And everybody's using national self-determination to justify their geopolitical needs. So we are in a situation where the Russians, who when they become economically pressed, become militarily dangerous, that's when they are the most likely to do something, come April have to make a decision. And I say April because that's when the ground will become firm again and the mud will go away. And the Russians are increasing their presence, but still not significantly in the pocket, and we await the next move. The American move was made 
we drew the line when General Hodges visited. Now the question is, what do the Russians do?